Hey guys, it's Dr. May. How are you? So I got a new episode today of Radically Open DBT. It's chock full of information about emotions, um, how they help us, how we can become more aware of them in all different ways. So if you're an emotions nerd like me, you're going to think this is a really cool um, chapter or lesson, so to speak, in Radically Open DBT. Okay, lots of cool stuff in here and uh, a lot of stuff to think about, really, um, a lot of stuff to observe. So I'm gonna buckle your seatbelts for this one, <laughs> okay? So there's a lot, of, a lot of things to think about, pay attention to. All right, so the, the lesson is called, How Do Emotions Help Us? But trust me, there's, there's, ev there's lots more than even just that, <laughs> okay? So here you go, you ready? All right, so just so you know, okay, as a reminder, so Radically Open DBT, was designed for people that are called quote unquote over controlled. Okay, so in earlier lessons, we talked about how if you're over controlled, you tend to be a little bit more closed than open. And you might have a harder time letting loose, relaxing, having fun, and all that kind of stuff. All right, so those are some of the features of over control. Another feature is that you may not be very open and comfortable with your emotions. Okay, so if that's the case, this um, lesson is designed to help you with, um, understand them better. Um, but if, even if you're not over controlled, there's still a lot to be learned here anyway. So no matter who you are, hopefully you'll get something from this lesson. Okay, so um, <laughs> here's my little intro. So we get it. If you're more of an over controlled person, you might be a little closed around your emotions, right? You might even feel like life would be better without emotions. It'd be better if I just wasn't emotional at all. Okay. And you might think that being in reasonable mind, kind of being more logical, so to speak, more left brain, is the ideal. It's like the way to go. And you might think, well, what's the point? Why should I have to understand my emotions? Why should I even pay attention to this, right? So if you're thinking that, we got you, okay? So we're gonna address some of your concerns today, um, but it's a bit of a challenge, all right? So I hope you're up for a challenge. Here we go. All right, so first we're gonna start with some myths about emotions that people who are over-controlled tend to have. Now, in the DBT, regular DBT, um, uh, you know, motion regulation module, they also have myths about emotions. And there's a couple that overlap, but their myths have to do with people who tend to be more emotional, the kind of myths that really emotional people tend to have about emotions. So these myths are a little bit different, as you'll see. So they're more for the kind of myths that over-controlled people tend to have about emotions, or people who are not as comfortable feeling and expressing emotions, all right? So if you're over-controlled, you might hold some of these emotion myths, okay? So one, kind of like I was hinting before, you might believe that an ideal life is emotion-free, right? Or we make our best decisions when emotions are kept out of it, okay? Actually, research shows that's not true and that people who don't have access to their emotions end up making decisions that aren't really that great. So it's important to have some kind of a feeling about the thing that you're trying to decide, in addition to some logic, okay? Number three, um, you might believe there's a right way to feel in every situation, okay? Maybe on paper, but in actuality, there's a lot of different reactions people could have to the same situation, right? Like where I work, um, I work at inpatient psychiatric hospital. There could be an incident in the ward, and everybody might have a little bit of a different reaction to it, okay? So there really isn't just one way to react. Everyone has their own spin on things, okay? Um, number four, emotion should be controlled. So there's that should word, right? So should is kind of like an expectation. It's kind of a belief. Um, it might be your belief, but maybe they don't always need to be controlled, maybe just sometimes, right? Number five, letting others know what I'm feeling inside is a sign of weakness. Mm. This might have been a message you got growing up, especially if you're male, right? So a lot of boys are told boys don't cry, you know, and that you, you would be weak if you were emotional. But again, that's just um, an opinion. That's not necessarily a fact, right? Most people dislike emotional people, um, not necessarily. Sometimes emotional people are very likable, okay? And sometimes it helps you to connect to somebody when they're open about their emotions, right? Number seven, negative feelings are bad and destructive. Okay, how about the way we act on negative feelings can be bad and destructive, but feelings themselves are just feelings, right? And they actually give us some important information about ourselves and what's going on, which we'll learn a little bit more about today. Number eight, feeling happy or excited is naive or childish. 
mm, kind of a judgment. All right, where did that come from? Who knows? Okay, here's a little Steve Carell. Not sure if he's really an unemotional person, but the, the picture looks a little that way. Okay, I digress. So number nine, love is only a chemical reaction. I feel like there's a line in a song about that somehow, but I, I'm, I'm struggling to think of the song. <laughs> anyway, um, but it's not just the chemicals, right? There's more to it than that. That's just a very um, broken down kind of materialistic view. But obviously there's a lot of feeling to it. There's a lot of nuance to it, right? It's not just the chemicals in your brain body. Number 10, it's important to never let another person know what you're really feeling inside, okay? How about never say never? Some situations appropriate, some situations not appropriate, okay? We have to discern which is which. 11, being emotional means being out of control, okay? For some people it does occasionally, but not for everybody all the time, right? Most emotions are really stupid. <laughs> Just another opinion, right? Uh, all painful emotions are a result of a bad attitude, okay? While our thoughts do influence our emotions and having a negative attitude can influence our emotions, not all painful emotions are from a bad attitude, okay? There's a variety of reasons why we feel different things. And sometimes it makes per perfect sense given a situation, okay? So if I'm sad because of, of a loss, is that because I have a bad attitude? Probably not, it's just a natural re reaction to a loss, right? Painful emotions are not really important, it should be ignored, hmm. okay. Well, they actually can give us some important information about things and, Feeling them and working through them could actually be a growth experience and could be healthy for us. And 15, people who feel happy are liars. <laughs> some people might be phony happy, but some people are genuinely happy. Okay, let's be fair. Okay, so those are just some emotional myths and a couple of my um, editorial comments about them, but you might have other ways of challenging these emotional myths. Unfortunately, because of YouTube, we can't really have a personal dialogue. Okay, but you can use your imagination. Okay. So despite the myths you might have for emotions, as I was kind of starting to say, emotions are actually here for a reason, right? We were evolved to have emotions. Even animals have some levels of emotions, okay? It's normal and natural for human beings to feel stuff, okay? And our goal isn't to shut off all feeling, okay? Why? One, emotions help us make decisions, okay? Um, sometimes it's a purely emotional decision and it helps us decide so fast we're not even thinking about it, right? So if I'm crossing the street and a truck starts coming barreling down the street, I don't wanna sit there and deliberate about it. I just wanna make the quick instant decision to run out of the way, okay? So that's a great survival decision that my emotion, my fear just helped make for me, okay? Um, so related to that, so it may make decisions for us sometimes or it contribute to our decisions, and then they lead us to do something. So you could think of the word emotion or in motion, okay? So the emotion leads us to wanna to do something. So the quick decision was, let's say, I need to get out of the way so I don't get hit by this truck. And then the motion or the action is to run away, okay? So I get the action urge to run away and then I run, all right? Just as an example, okay? Other times it leads us to make a decision, but it's also influenced by our reasoning. Okay, so it depends on the situation. Okay, another important function of emotions is its communicative value. Okay, so as you probably have heard, like body language has a lot to do with our communication, maybe like 70% or something to that effect. Don't quote me on the exact percentage. I, I, I'm not completely sure if that's right, but it's something to that effect, right? Nonverbals. So our nonverbals are often expressing how we feel without words. So if you look at these pictures, we don't know exactly what those people are saying, but it's very clear about what's being communicated, right? So if you look at the first picture on the upper right, the girl on the right looks like she has some kind of caring and concern toward that older woman, right? You could tell by her gestures, by her face, right? And maybe the woman on the left is feeling a little sad, a little pensive, um, a little uncomfortable maybe, right? Bottom left, clearly <laughs> the woman on the right looks very angry, right? And the guy on the left is kind of reacting to her anger, all right? So she's up in his face yelling. So there's clearly a, a, an emotion being conveyed here, okay? And then bottom right, all three guys look very comfortable. They look very happy, very engaged, very um, happy. Uh, I'm sorry, I said happy, um, you know, they're at ease with each other, 
right? And so they're conveying that through their body language and that's driven by their emotions, okay? So if we weren't conveying our emotions non-verbally, we wouldn't know what the heck was going on, right? It would be very hard to tell. Um, so it's, it really helps um, us to form relationships and communicate. Okay, another thing is that emotions facilitate empathic responding. So empathy is being able to read someone else's emotions or kind of feel a little bit of what they're feeling, maybe have a little bit of a cognitive understanding of what they're feeling, and then respond to them accordingly, appropriately. All right, and being able to do that with each other helps us to connect, helps us to understand each other. And when we reveal our emotions to each other, it helps us feel like, you know, I could, I, I, I want to relate to that person, right? I feel some kind of um, an affinity for that person, okay? So it contributes to our social bonds. Okay, so here's how it works. I tried to enhance the, uh, the diagram that I found on the internet on the left. So let's say the person on the left observes the person on the right expressing some kind of a nonverbal emotion, okay? So let's say the emotion is sadness, okay? So the person on the left is observing sadness in the person on the right, and naturally, without even thinking about it, his or her face micro mimics the sadness in his or her face. I, let's say it's a guy, sorry, the his or her gets, so let's say the guy on the left micro mimics the, the emotions of the woman on the right. So because his face is showing a little bit of sadness, it's communicating to his brain, to his mirror neurons, a little bit of sadness. So his brain is telling him a little bit of helping him experience a little bit of the sadness the woman is feeling, okay? So that kind of helps him feel that. And because he feels that, he can kind of understand her a little bit better and gives him the tools and the ability to then communicate his understanding of her sadness back to her. And then she feels more understood and it helps the bond. See how that goes? And it goes both ways. Um, you know, so we kind of do this ongoing as we communicate, okay, so long as we're tuned in. So our own micromimicry in our face helps us to understand the emotions. So people who have a very flat affect, flat facial expression, or even who have Botox, have a harder time feeling and understanding the emotions of other people, right? When you don't feel it, make the face, you can't feel it as much. It's kind of interesting the way it's all connected, okay? All right. Another thing, learning to label emotions. Why bother? So label emotions mean putting an emotional word to the experience that you're having, to the actual feeling and thought that, and you know, physical reaction that you're having. So calling it something, calling it sadness, calling it anger, anxiety, happiness, joy, right? So when I put a label to it, it gives me more information, right? So as we're gonna see in a couple of minutes, each emotion has its own action urge, right? So every time I feel something, it makes me feel like doing something. And that helps me predict what I might end up doing. So like the woman, the fortune teller on the left, understanding what the emotion is, helps me to possibly predict the future. And knowing that future thing could happen, it helps me decide what to do, right? So for example, if I realize I'm feeling angry, I know that anger could lead me to act out by yelling, by hitting, by attacking. And so if I don't want to get myself in trouble by letting loose too much with my anger, I might then decide to maybe walk away and cool off for a little while, right? So if I don't like the future that I see, I could try to make a different decision, right? So that could be helpful. Just So just putting the word to it gives me more of a clue about what could be to come, all right? All right. On the right, um, labeling our emotions makes it easier for us to communicate to other people, like we're talking about communicating. So if I were to actually say to somebody, I'm feeling sad, that we understand what sadness means. You know, we, generally, we have a general idea about what it's like for someone to feel sad. So even if you didn't see the person, or even if you weren't paying attention to the nonverbals, when someone tells you, I'm feeling sad, it now helps you to respond better to that person and to connect with that person, okay? So it uh, facilitates the ability for us to empathize. Okay, so believe it or not, the manual actually uses these words, <laughs> okay? So they say four steps, but then later on they give a fifth step. So I'm gonna put all five steps here. Um, the homework had five, the other part had four. So five steps to emotion labeling bliss, okay? So 
this is going to be a blissful experience, as you probably can guess. All right. So a lot of things to be mindful of as we come to the conclusion about what we're feeling. All right. So buckle up. Here we go. Okay. So one, we got to de describe or figure out what's the thing that's leading me to feel this way. All right. Is it a cue that's happening on the inside of me? Right. Is it something about my physiology, my body sensations, or my thoughts? that's leading me to feel a certain way, right? So my thinking kind of things that aren't fueling my emotions, um, if I'm thinking, oh, that guy's such an idiot, I can't stand him, he's such a jerk, maybe that's influencing my anger. Maybe my physical sensation of heat and tightness is influencing my anger. Or maybe I have a chronic pain or I'm in pain or something like that, and that's influencing how I'm feeling too, right? So there could be all kinds of things going on within me, all right? Oftentimes, the cue occurs outside of our body, right? So maybe someone's behaving a certain way toward us in the environment, or something's going on in the physical environment, in the place that we're in, or there's something that has to do with a thing. Maybe my, my, my wallet is missing, and now I'm upset about that, right? So there could be something in the environment that's leading me to feel this way, all right? And let me move myself. What extent did contextual factors matter? So by that, they kind of mean maybe there's something about the fact that it's the, a certain day of the week or a certain time of the year or time of the day that's influencing how I'm feeling, right? So maybe I struggle with things in the nighttime. I'm more, you know, my mind's quieter or there's, there's less activity in the world, so my mind starts to get busier. Um, I'm more tired. Maybe um, it's fall right now. Maybe this time of the year, the fall time, is reminding me of something that's painful. Maybe it's an anniversary reaction, right? Or maybe the fact that the weather is getting colder and it's getting darker outside is influencing my emotions, right? So there can be all kinds of things factoring in here. So that's kind of more of a context, okay? All right, step two. Identify the brain-body emotion system that is triggered by the cue. So now that I'm exposed to those triggers, what's one of those five systems that we talked about in lesson two? okay, that are now being stimulated. So for example, am I, do I feel an activation of my social safety system? Do I feel an activation of my novelty system, looking out and orienting myself to something discrepant in the environment? Is my reward system being activated? Like am I feeling excited about something that's going to be something good happening to me soon? Is my threat system activated because I'm afraid something bad's going to happen? Or is my overwhelm system activated because I can't run, I can't hide, you know, and I, I, I can't move and I feel shut down, all right? So which one of those five is predominant, all right? And based on the, the one that I pick, it affects the way I socially signal to other people, right? So it's affecting my body language, it's affecting my ability to connect, okay? So obviously if I'm in the social safety system, that's the best system for connecting with other people. So if I'm finding that I'm comfortable socializing, that it's very easy for me to make eye contact, I'm comfortable expressing my emotions, my voice tone is kind of easygoing and melodic, and I'm comfortable touching and being touched and reaching out to people, chances are my social safety system is being activated because that's how I'm socially signaling, okay? However, um, if my novelty system is activated, something discrepant happened in the environment, I might withdraw my social safety route response, and all of a sudden be standing still like that rabbit, kind of gazing intently, trying to figure out where the, the cue is coming from to try to determine if it's dangerous or if it's safe. I'm listening carefully, right? So I'm kind of in that, uh-oh, what's going on mode, all right? So that's a novelty sign, okay? So I'm not very social. I withdrew the social because I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Reward system. So I might be relating to people. I may be talking very excitedly and gesturing in a big kind of a way, but I might not be paying attention to the other person that much. So I'm talking, I'm communicating, but it's probably mostly about me and the thing I'm excited about, okay? So it might be hard to receive, but it's easier to share, <laughs> okay? So that's the reward system. Okay, the threat system. Chances are that might happen if I'm feeling socially anxious, or like uncomfortable around somebody, right? So there's a defensive arousal happening. So that affects my ability to socially signal, okay? Because I might find 
my stuff kind of stiff and uncomfortable. Um, it's hard to smile. My face might feel a little stony. Um, my voice tone might be a little flat, a little strident. And my gesture is like the woman in the picture might be a little tight and contained. So very different from the reward system where it's kind of big and out there, right? I might feel like a self-protective sort of a mode because I'm uncomfortable, threat system. And finally, in the overwhelm or shutdown response, I'm probably not socially signaling at all, right? I'm pretty much like in the mode where I'm playing dead. I'm not fighting, I'm not fleeing, I'm not engaging. I'm just kind of shutting down and I'm expressionless. I'm probably not talking very much. If I am talking, my voice is probably very flat. Um, I'm barely moving because I'm shut down or if I'm moving, it's very slow. I might feel numb inside. I might be staring in a vacant kind of a way, right? So. I'd be more like the woman in the picture where I'm not very socially engaged and not signaling to people that I'm comfortable talking right now, okay? So these are the clues we could be looking for within ourselves. All right, so next, observe action urges and desires. So like I mentioned before, emotion, think in motion, right? The emotion makes us feel like doing something. We may or may not actually do it, but it, it instills this kind of, it, it creates this urge within us, this desire to, to act on the emotion and do something, right? So if we notice what that desire is, it can give us a clue about what the emotion is, right? So we're getting more specific. So we went from an arousal kind of a system, right? Like these five things, and now it's stratifying into the actual emotion words that we're kind of a little more familiar with. Okay, so if I have a desire to flee or to run away, chances are I'm feeling fear, okay? If I have a, and, um, like a mobile response to threat. If I'm feeling shame, I probably have an urge to hide or disappear, right? We often feel like covering our faces and crawling in a hole, <laughs> right, if we feel shame. So that kind of goes along, that's your action urge with that. More about related to the shutdown response. Um, if we feel guilt and we feel bad about something we did that violated our own values, we might have an urge to repair or make amends or, or apologize. If we're sad, we have probably have the urge to isolate or deactivate, also related to the shutdown system, right? When you feel sad, sometimes you just wanna take a nap and go under the covers, right? It kind of slows you down. Disgust, like the girl in the picture from uh, Inside Out. <laughs> urge to push away or expel, right? Usually wanna throw up if you're kind of disgusted, okay? Probably won't do that for real, but you might have an urge in some sort of fashion. Joy, like jumping for joy, right? You're kind of um, in that reward mode. You're kind of very excited. You're jumping around, right? If you're lo in love, experiencing love, you probably want, you're in that social engagement mode. You want to relax and socialize. You want to connect with somebody, right? Curiosity, more like that mode of, gee, I wonder what's going on, right? You want to explore the environment. Okay, what was that noise? Hmm, let's figure it out. Okay, envy, the urge to gossip or get revenge. Hmm, I wish I had what you have, and I want to destroy, destroy you, what you have because I can't have it either. <laughs> okay, that's pretty much envy. Um, bitterness, the urge to reject, help, give up, and blame. Hmm, what a painful emotion, right? All right, jealousy. All right, so envy and jealousy are different, even though we often interchange them. So Envy is when you have something that I want and I wish I could take it away from you so I have it because maybe I feel like I deserve it more than you. Jealousy is when I don't want to lose what I have, especially a relationship, right? So if you look in the picture, so let's say the girl on the right feeling jealous because her boyfriend is looking at another girl. So she doesn't want to lose the guy to another girl. She wants to protect what she has and she probably wants to block him or block the other girl from socializing with her boyfriend, right? So Ursha blocks someone from getting close to someone I'm close to, right? I don't want her messing around with my man, <laughs> right? So that's pretty much jealousy. All right, and then finally, anger, urge to attack, okay? So that's the fight of the fight or flight, whereas the fear is the urge to run away, but both with mobilization responses to threat, okay? So obviously there's more emotions, but I think we got a pretty good sampling here so far, okay? Okay, step five. So this is a reminiscent of what we went over in the very beginning. After you experience the emotion, you identify what it is. You decide, huh, how is this functioning for me? Is it helping me make a decision? 
is the emotion motivating my behavior or my actions? Is it helping me to communicate to somebody? Or is it helping me connect with somebody with empathy? Or more than one thing, okay? That's why I function with S in parentheses. Okay, so because this is pretty complex, <laughs> and there's, it's five steps and that's a lot, I wanted to give a couple of examples just to show how this could work, okay? And it probably would help if you reflected on a situation and you actually wrote this down, okay? So you could like take a screenshot or something and, and write down these five steps and practice it like a homework assignment because actually in the manual, it is a homework assignment, okay? But here we go. So one, this example. So the cue or a trigger, let's say a car cut me off on the highway, external cue, right? Something in the environment that's happening. As I was driving home from work and feeling tired, so the tiredness is an internal cue that's adding to this situation, okay? And possibly a contextual cue because it's the time of the day when I'm going home after work and that context is happening, right? So it's a little overlap. All right, so step two, brain body emotion sig signal system triggered by the cue, the threat system, right? So if someone's cutting me off, it might be threatening my safety on the road, right? So I'm feeling a little bit riled up because of that. Notice how I'm socially signaling. Um, so I have tense muscles and gestures and a loud and strident voice. Hey, what are you doing, man? <laughs> okay. Um, step four, observe action, urges, and desires. Mm. Um, you could only imagine what you may feel like doing. I'm sure you've been through this before. So let's say I have an urge to attack. So therefore, it's most likely anger, right? You cut me off. You're endangering me. I'm pissing me off and now I want to get back at you, all right? So I want to approach the car, maybe tailgate him. Urgh. I want to give him the finger, I want to curse at him, honk my horn, right? Or worse, road rage, right? So urge to attack or anger. So what's the function of this emotion? So maybe it's influencing my decision about how I'm behaving. So maybe I didn't do all of those things, but maybe, you know, I felt like in some way I should communicate my disapproval to that other car. You know, so maybe I'll follow some of my action urges. So maybe I'll um, honk the horn or I'll just, um, you know, yell in my car, but not say something that would get me in trouble. So maybe I did part of it, but not all of it. Um, so that could be an example of, you know, what actually happened. Okay. So it's following my action urge. Okay. So that's example one. Here's example two. Describe the cue or a trigger. So let's say I'm hanging out in my living room, talking with a friend. I heard a big bang outside, okay? So that's an external cue, because we were just talking, it was nothing, that was a problem. So my novelty system was triggered because something discrepant happened in the environment, something unexpected, unusual, that I'm not sure if it's dangerous or not dangerous, right? So in order to evaluate this cue, I sat still, I looked toward the window where I thought I heard the noise, and I paused the conversation, right? So I withdrew temporarily, my social engagement response. So my urge was to explore with curiosity. Hmm, gee, I wonder what's going on, right? So I wanted to look out the window and see what the noise is. Maybe there's something outside I can see that's gonna give me a clue, okay? So what's the function of the emotion? Maybe it functioned to help me decide to get up and look out the window and follow my action urge, okay? So I hope that helps put it all together with these examples, all right? So um, now you have some more tools to be mindful of your emotions, okay? It's a little complex, but it's kind of an interesting exercise and I hope it helps you uh, understand your emotional response better. All right, thanks for listening and I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye for now.